You guys were fast today. We are this morning in the midst of the Jewish High Holy Days. We are right between Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and Yom Kippur, the Days of Atonement. And the Jewish tradition has much to say about our subject this morning. So let us begin with the Hebrew Scriptures. This congregation subversive Bible studies class has spent the last several months considering the Hebrew Scriptures. We have a great time grappling with these old texts. And you're welcome to join us anytime. You can just email me for info. My email is on the back of your order of service cover. The Hebrew Bible is, of course, the part of the Bible that you might also know as the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible, there's a story, chapter 18, in which God appears to Abraham, the great patriarch of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. God appears to Abraham in the form of three strangers. The story begins, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing right across from him in the near distance. We know something about high afternoon heat here in New Mexico, especially this last week. And we are at high elevation in Albuquerque and Socorro and Edgewood. At Mamre, Abraham was probably at about the same altitude as our members in Carlsbad, but further south. And we wear wicking fabrics and we have swamp coolers. Abraham was sitting by the entrance to his tent. It isn't even an adobe structure. No relief from the heat there, except for a spot of shade. And when he sees the strangers standing in the high afternoon Mediterranean sun, he gets up and hurries. That's what the text says. He doesn't walk, but he runs out to greet them. He bows before them all the way down to the ground and insists that they accept his hospitality, his spot of shade, water to wash their feet. A bite to eat, he says, and then prepares a whole calf, cakes made of fine meal, curds, and milk. The text doesn't explain what it means by saying that the Lord appeared as three strangers. This is the Hebrew Bible, though. There's no doctrine of the Trinity implied here. In other passages, God appears in many other ways, as fire, angels, a threatening stranger in the night, as dreams, visions, wind, and a still, quiet voice. Sometimes there's no mention of God's physical appearance, only the statement that God appeared. The text will later refer to these same strangers as angels, too, as messengers of God. We often think of the God of the Bible as an angry, white father with a beard, but that image must have come much later. The Hebrew Bible resists giving God any one image or even a name. And so it happens in this story. Abraham, the great patriarch of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, recognizes God in the faces of nameless strangers. The strangers, angels, God, accept his hospitality. And they give Abraham and his wife their blessings. Later, when the angels leave, they head into a very different situation. They go to the village of Sodom. Most of you have probably heard the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's one of the most violent stories in the Bible. You can find it in children's Bibles, however, greatly softened versions. Those versions tend to be accompanied by illustrations of cherubic white people dressed in monastic robes and toting camels. Cherubic with round, childlike faces and rosy cheeks. I think that for those of us who were raised in Christian churches and then left as adolescents, that might be the version of the story that you remember, because in a subversive Bible studies class, people were shocked to see what was actually in there. I'm going to tread as lightly as I can with language here without giving you the cherubic version. When the angels arrive in Sodom, they meet a man named Lot, who invites them to eat and stay at his home. 
It must have been a mild night, or maybe one of them sleepwalks, or they're planning to leave again before dawn, because they say, no thanks. We're planning to sleep in the town square, they explain. That will suit us just fine. Worry passes over Lot's face. He insists and insists that they stay with him. He's so insistent that it becomes too awkward to refuse. So they go with him. Lot bakes some fresh bread for them, the Hebrew Bible says, and then they eat together. But before they've gone to bed, there's a banging at the door. Lot peers out and sees a terrible sight. It is just as he feared. All of the men of Sodom, from every part of town and every age, the text says, were on Lot's doorstep, yelling at him to send the visitors out so the crowd of men can violate them. They yell this at Lot. They use unambiguous language. Don't do this wicked thing, says Lot. He offers the angry mob one of his daughters instead. That part is left out of children's versions. Luckily, the crowd refuses. They yell at Lot, telling him he has no right to tell them what to do because he himself is a foreigner. Then the angels tell Lot and his family to flee, and quickly. They say God is going to destroy the city. It has become so evil, it's unsalvageable. As Lot and his family escape into the hills, fire rains down on Sodom. They aren't supposed to look back, but Lot's wife can't resist. And when she does look, she is instantly turned into salt, a pillar of salt. The symbolism of that would probably have been obvious to ancient listeners. Everyone hence has been trying to figure it out. Overall, though, many people think they have the rest of this story figured out, and that it is proof that God hates gays. That's a pretty big leap. I'll tell you why. Now, granted, the Bible is a collection of old, old, old stories. And it says many things with which we would and should disagree. But it also disagrees with itself over and over again. Because Bible stories, rather than laying out moral codes once and for all, are stories that show our spiritual ancestors grappling with issues of morality. The Bible contains old prohibitions against gay relationships, and the Bible also says that love is the most important law of all and that love supersedes all else. So you can use the Bible to proof text all day long and you can probably make it a case for just about anything you want. But if you're looking for proof about God's position on gays, I don't think the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be of much use. There's no gay couple in this story. There's no same gender relationship of the kind that we are now honoring with marriage equality in Bernalillo, Doña Ana, Santa Fe, San Miguel, Taos, and Valencia counties. Instead, there are some strangers a foreign-born man, and a hostile mob. What behavior is condemned in this story? In order to get it, you have to pay attention to the story that preceded the scene in Sodom, the one in which Abraham sees the strangers in the distance, runs to greet them, and treats them like long-lost friends. In the one, strangers are welcomed. In the other, they are attacked by a mob. What is condemned is violence towards strangers. Paired with the Abraham story that precedes it, it seems pretty clear that this story is about hospitality. It's important to know these Bible stories and to be able to challenge bad interpretations of them because they are still influential. Sodom is where we get the word sodomy. Although the Supreme Court struck down sodomy laws 10 years ago, 13 states still have them on the books, and for the last few years, a sheriff in Baton Rouge has been conducting sting operations to arrest law-abiding gay men. 
Tell me, who is more like the men of Sodom? The gay men of Baton Rouge, who would be consensual lovers? Or the sheriff and his men, who tricked them into being illegally arrested and held against their will in jails, where, by the way, violation of the kind in this story is endemic? It's important to know these stories. If you track down the etymology of the words host, hospice, hospitality, and hospital, you'll find that their root, ghosty, is also the root of the word guest. Host and guest were once the same word. In Spanish, you can find the same kind of connection Hospedar means to host, huesped means guest, and they are from the same root. The words give and receive also share a root. A theological understanding of hospitality might begin with the fact that we are all guests of God, if you like, or of the earth, or of the universe, provided with what we need for our well-being, and not only that, but for our great pleasure not only brown rice, but ripe peaches. Not only green beans, but green chili. Not only sunlight, but sunrises and sunsets. And not only ourselves, but our companions, known and unknown. Abraham saw the divine in the strangers, and by showing them hospitality, returned to God what God had given to Abraham through the very gift of his life. Here on the brink of Yom Kippur, the Days of Atonement, that story of hospitality sounds also like a story of atonement to me. Hospitality as atonement, a completion of the sacred circle of host and guest. Now, we Unitarian Universalists, we are a polite people. And we long to be a religious community that is authentic and true and reflects the world we live in, in all its glorious diversity, strangers, neighbors, and all. Our theology that there's more than one path to truth or to God, and that spiritual wisdom from any and all of the world's traditions is not a threat, but an opportunity to grow in wisdom and in humility is a reflection of our longing, a sacred longing deeply theologically grounded. But we also live in a place and a moment in history that makes us vulnerable. I don't live in a tent like Abraham's, close to other tents, filled with family members and members of my tribe who know me and can hear me if I show hospitality to a stranger who turns out to be hostile. I live in a neighborhood that has lots of break-ins, and the house I bought came with four locks on its front door and a security camera. I took a rape aggression defense class with my daughter a few years ago, and we fought off simulated attacks by male police officers in padded suits. When we are alone at night, I and most women are constantly aware of our vulnerability, and I worry for my son and my husband, too, who are kind and gentle men. This is the world that we live in, too, you and I, in this state of anxiety and isolation, and it makes us vulnerable. And so it's not an automatic thing. It's not straightforward, maybe not even smart, to give or even accept hospitality from strangers so freely. And it goes against many of our normal tendencies, too, our inherent tendencies to stick with the relative safety of our own kind or tribe or to stay in our comfort zones. And not only that, but not much hospitality is really expected in this time and place. The Christian essayist D.M. Dowlings writes that even a soup kitchen, though necessary, isn't in itself hospitality. Maybe the lack of real hospitality in our day is the reason why people are homeless and soup kitchens exist. We've mostly forgotten as a society to see the prevalence of things like homelessness and poverty as a sign of spiritual failing a failure of hospitality. That level of hospitality is not expected. 
Those are the facts. We won't solve everything this morning. That's okay. There's always more work to do than can be done. That's okay. It's not your job to shoulder the weight of the world. It's your job to walk in the world with as much integrity as you can muster and with joy and with peace in your heart because you've opened your eyes and you do what you can while still maintaining a balanced and happy life. If you do that, if you do what you can and you allow yourself to be at peace and if you are happy and if you indulge in joy at every opportunity, then what you are doing will be contagious. And that's what we need to turn this world around. If we were to begin right here in our own lives and with this congregation, what would that look like? What if we started right here where we are in this spiritual community that deeply values hospitality, if we went far beyond being polite or helpful and gave ourselves to radical hospitality, what would it be like? Or as my colleague Marilyn Sewell put it, what would it mean to receive someone, a stranger, with a presence that was not just polite, but to receive them with revolutionary generosity? Well, in order to think about or to imagine radical hospitality, you must first imagine that there might be someone who does not feel welcome, or who isn't sure if they're welcome. Think for a moment about the following hypothetical people and the extent to which they would feel either politely or very warmly welcomed in our congregation. None of them is a particular real person, but they all have characteristics of real people who have either come to this church or to another one that I was part of. Consider an off-duty police officer, Caucasian, with a military haircut and a Romney sticker on his car, who sits toward the front of the sanctuary next to the single mother he is dating and her two kids. Or an African-American couple in their 30s with a Southern Pentecostal background who have checked out our website and think this place might be a good fit for them theologically, so they put on their nicest clothes and bring their Bibles with them on their first day. A man in a Harley Davidson vest and leather boots with a big tattoo of the American flag on his arm. A tall woman, elegantly dressed, with beautiful long hair, patent leather pumps, and a matching bag, and facial features that suggest strongly that she was born a man. A successful businessman and his adolescent daughter, who's five feet seven inches tall and weighs 90 pounds. She's battling anorexia. A man in his 50s whose wife has died. She was never a churchgoer. He thought he was ready to try us out, but the casual chit-chat of those around him is too stark a contrast with his grief, and he feels unbearably alone. How about a teenage girl with a two-year-old and an infant in tow? When the baby begins fussing during the sermon, she starts to breastfeed him. Or a couple who smile nervously as they enter, revealing missing teeth. They've been regulars in our food pantry line, but they aren't sure whether it was okay for them to attend worship. No one's mentioned it before. Or a family whose children are part of our after-school tutoring program, who haven't been to church since arriving in the U.S., but it's Easter, and the kids suggested this one. They don't know where they're allowed to sit or what the rules for worship are. They wonder if they have overstepped. Sometimes, even when we want to be welcoming, to provide hospitality, unconscious attitudes get in our way. In Yom Kippur, the Kippur is from Kippurim, which means to cleanse, forgive, be merciful, pardon, purge away, and make reconciliation. We're invited, encouraged, to uproot and purge attitudes and thoughts that are harmful to ourselves or others. Here are some thoughts we would do well to banish. See if they're as familiar to you as they are to me. 
I just don't understand why he dresses like that. She must be trying to call attention to herself. Why does he have to use so much slang? People shouldn't have more kids than they can afford. She looks like she thinks she's better than everyone else. He probably looks down on me. They must not know what Unitarian Universalism is. Or I don't think we should invite them to church. It might offend them. How about that art of invitation? We have some good outreach programs here. They improve a lot. They improve the lives of our volunteers and the people we serve, and we keep dreaming up and trying out new ways to help others, most recently a prison outreach program. And we're proud of all these efforts, and we should be. But what else could we do as a church that is committed to not just helping, but to radical hospitality? As a guest, I feel politely treated when I go for dinner at someone's house and they invite me to take a seat and they won't let me do the dishes and I am served on their nicest plates. But I feel warmly welcomed when I hear something more like, mi casa es tu casa, my house is your house. And I chat with the hostess while we chop a salad together and she shows me her garden and gives me a few seeds from her favorite flowers. And then she accepts my offer to return the favor in my own way. A church like ours practices radical hospitality when we reach out, but also invite the same people in and more people. We practice radical hospitality when we're not afraid that we might have to change in order to make room for the gifts and address the needs of others. Or maybe we are afraid, if we're honest, but we're willing anyway. That's okay, too. A church like ours practices radical hospitality when we set out to do so intentionally, individually, and together. We have all the room we need now and plenty of people power to practice radical hospitality. The only question now is how much room there is in our hearts and imaginations to discover how.